good evening students so welcome to another session so we have been talking a few things with regards to organic evolution so with respect to that in the previous session we discussed a few things with regards to several theories which was given by a few scientists with regards to the origin of life right so with regards to that evolution which was given by two scientists oparin as well as halden right so they came up with something called as the chemical theory right and the chemical theory followed by uh, followed by uh, chemical theory followed by the biological theory right in between the chemical theory and biological theory we took up with something called as the formation of protobionts right so in that juncture we have seen about how exactly the universe was originated how the earth was formed right so how the protobionts were formed and we also spoke about the first life forms right so we took up with four different groups of organisms in the previous session right so one was called the anaerobic heterotrophs second one was chemoautotrophs the third one was anoxygenic photoautotrophs and the fourth one was the oxygenic photoautotrophs right so these prokaryotes now it led to the formation of eukaryotes right and from the eukaryotes different organ or different species have been evolved so that is what we have seen in the previous session right so whatever theories we have seen so far are all said to be hypothetical theories right that's what we have been telling from the first class itself right so all the theories which were proposed by these scientists are all considered as the hypothetical theories right so there is no physical proof or there is no proper uh, proof that is available for these particular theories right and what some of the scientists also say is right so nobody has an idea regarding evolution right or what we can put it this way nobody has a idea about any single change that occurred during the in an organism during the course of evolution so what does that mean evolution is a very 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 slow process and what scientists say is the human lifespan is so short that even a single change also in favor of evolution no one has identified it because what most of the scientists say is it takes almost more than hundreds and hundreds of years for the process of evolution to occur so even one single change also it takes almost hundreds of years if, if, with regards to that if you see the human lifespan is said to be very very short to observe even one single change also so for that reason what the scientists have done is right so for this reason what the scientists have done is they have started collecting evidences from different branches of biology right so they started collecting evidences from different branches of biology to show that evolution has taken place right so in this session we'll be taking up with the different evidences given by or rather collected by different scientists with regards to different branches of biology so by identifying those different evidences from different branches of biology we can say that evolution had taken place in so and so ways right so in today's session let us begin with the evidences for organic evolution right so the topic what we are going to take up today is the evidences for organic evolution or we can put it this way the evidences for biological evolution i think that would be the apt term rather than organic evolution we can use the term biological evolution evidences for biological evolution so we'll be taking up with the evidences for biological evolution right so as i've already said scientists have collected evidences from different branches of biology so what are the different branches of biology scientists worked on and what are the different branches of biology they started collecting evidences so first we'll take up those different uh, evidences then we'll get into details of each so the first branch of biology or rather the first type of evidence what we'll be studying is evidences from evidences from comparative anatomy evidences from comparative anatomy right so this is the first branch what we'll be studying the evidences from comparative anatomy the second one what we'll be taking up is evidences from embryology 
evidences from embryology. So this is the second one what we'll be taking. The third thing what we'll be taking up is evidences from paleontology. Paleontology, right? So evidences from paleontology. And the fourth evidence what we'll be studying is evidences from cell and molecular biology. Right, so evidences from cell and molecular biology. So these are the four different types of evidences what we'll be taking up in this particular session. Right. So the first thing what we'll be taking up is with regards to evidences from comparative anatomy. So what does this comparative anatomy mean? We can put it this way also. We can either write it as uh, evidences from comparative anatomy, or we can also write it as uh, morphological, morphological and anatomical evidences, right? Either morphological or anatomical evidences. So what does this mean? I hope all are familiar with the term morphology and anatomy, right? So morphology is nothing but study about external characteristic features of a particular organism. Anatomy is study about the internal features or internal structures of an organism is anatomy. So by comparing the morphology as well as anatomy, of different organisms, right? So what we are trying to do here is we are trying to compare the morphology as well as the anatomy of different organisms. So by comparing the morphology and anatomy of these different organisms, we will be able to say how exactly evolution has taken place. So that is the first branch what scientists have studied. So right, evidences with regards to comparative anatomy that is morphological and anatomical evidences. Second branch is evidences pertaining to embryology. Now talking about embryology, I hope all are familiar with embryology. It is a branch of science that deals with the study of embryos, that is embryology. Right? So by observing the embryos of various organisms, right? so by observing the embryos of various organisms, we can correlate how exactly evolution has taken place. So this is the second thing what we'll be studying. The third one what we'll be studying is evidences from paleontology so paleontology is something to do with fossils right it is something to do with fossils right so by studying the fossils i hope all are familiar with fossils right fossils are nothing but the remains of dead organisms right which were present almost centuries ago right so by studying these fossils we can start correlating those fossil organisms with the present day organisms the last evidence what we'll be studying is evidence from cell as well as molecular biology. So this is actually considered as the most definite form of uh, evidences which are available, right, with regards to the process called biological evolution, right. So these are the four different types of uh, evidences studies what we'll be taking up in a couple of sessions, right. So for that today, let us begin with the evidences from comparative anatomy. So we'll be starting off with the evidences from comparative anatomy. So let's begin with evidences from comparative anatomy. Right. So as we have already said, it is nothing but evidences with regards to morphology as well as anatomy. So anatomical as well as morphological evidences. So the first one what we'll be taking up is evidences from evidences from comparative anatomy. So we'll be taking up with evidences from comparative anatomy. That is morphological evidence as well as the morphological as well as the anatomical evidences. So let's take up with these morphological and anatomical evidences. Right. Now, by observing the morphology as well as anatomy of different organisms, right? So by observing or by studying the morphology as well as the anatomy of different organisms, right? We can identify some sort of similarities between all of these organisms, right? Let me put it once again, by observing, right? By observing the morphology as well as the anatomy of different organisms, right? We will be able to identify some sort of similarities between all of those organisms, right? Now, these similarities will start giving us some sort of a relationship between all of those organisms, 
right? So what we are trying to say by studying the morphology and anatomy of the organisms, we will be able to identify some sort of similarities in all of these organisms. Right. So these similarities in the organism would give us some sort of relationship between all of those organisms. Right. So those relationships can be studied under different heads. So what we have, what we'll be studying under that is the first one under uh, evidences from comparative anatomy. What we'll be studying is something with regards to homologous organs. Right. We'll be studying about homologous organs. Right. So this is the first one. Right. So the relationship between different organisms could be studied by studying these type of organs which are called as homologous organs. So I tell you what are these homologous organs all that. The second type of organs what we will be studying is called as analogous organ. Analogous organ. So this is the second type of study what we will be taking up. Right. Analogous organs. The third one what we will be studying is with regards to something called as vestigial organs. Vestigial organs. So this is the third one what we will be studying which is the vestigial organs. The fourth one what we will be studying is right. So the fourth one what we will be studying is something called as atavistic organs. Atavistic organs. And the last one number five what we will be studying is with regards to connecting links. Right. So by studying all of these organs, right. So by studying all of these organs, right. So we will be able to identify or we will be getting some sort of proofs with regards to the process called as evolution. Right. As I've already said, the process of evolution is a very, very slow process. And as scientists say, humans are not able to identify even a single change also with regards to evolution because the lifespan of humans is very, very small. And for a single change to occur, it takes several years to get. So that is the reason why scientists have started collecting some sort of evidences with regards to uh, with regards to the anatomy as well as morphology of the organs. Right. So by studying all of these organs, that is homologous organs, analogous organs, the vestigial organs, the atavistic organs, as well as the connecting links, we will be able to identify what sort of a relationship exists between two organisms or between several organisms, right? And in what way evolution has taken place. So let us start taking up each of these organs in little detail. So let us first begin with this homologous organs, right? So let's take up with the homologous organs, then we'll get into the remaining organs, right? Now, what do this homologous organs mean? Right. So what does homologous organ mean? So homologous organs are, I'll just first write down here, then we'll get into the details of homologous organs. So what are these homologous organs? Organs of, organs of similar structure, similar structure and origin, similar structure and origin, but perform but perform different functions, but perform different functions. So these type of organs are referred to as homologous organs, right? So what are homologous organs? Organs of similar structure, right? Number one, what we need to remember? Structures is the same. Organs of similar structure. Number two, origin also is same. Right? So if there are two organs having the same structure and same origin, but perform different functions, they are referred to as homologous organs. Right? So in simple, what are homologous organs? Organs of similar structure and similar origin, but they perform different function, they are actually referred to as homologous organs. Right. So this, what examples can we give for homologous organs? Right. So what sort of examples can we give for homologous organs? So let us take down the examples here for homologous organs. Right. So if you see the examples, so we can take the skeleton of hand in case of humans. Right. So hand in humans. 
right similarly the four limbs four limbs in horse or cheetah or any higher organisms higher animal four limbs of horse right so then we can take the example of four limbs four limbs in bats as well as flippers in wing flippers in wing right so all of these organisms right all of these structures that is the hand the hand in case of humans the four limbs four limbs here and the flippers all of these structures have same all of these have same structure and they are of the same origin but based on different places where they survive or based on their habitats their functions keep changing right so all of these structures their structure is same and their origin also is same but they perform different functions so such type of organs are called as homologous organs so all these are the examples of homologous organs let us take two examples here talking about hands in case of humans and four limbs in horses right so hands i said and the four limbs in horses both the skeletal system remains the same structure is the same and similarly their function also is the same sorry structure is the same their origin also is the same but based on their habitat right so based on their habitat their function changes what is the function of human hand to hold things right so the function of human hand is to hold things what is the function of four limbs in case of horses to run right so to hold to run functions are different structure is same origin is same but function is different such type of organs are called as homologous organs right so based on these organs we can say that there is some sort of relation between humans as well as horse there is some sort of relation between humans and bats there is also some sort of relation between humans as well as bats also so that's how evolution evidences we get from evolution right so what you need to remember here with regards to homologous organs any organs if they have similar structure which are of the same origin but they perform different function such type of organs are referred to as homologous organs right so this is some of one of the example what we can give in case of animals similarly one more example we can take in case of plants right so the example in case of plants what we can take is we can take talk about tubers right so tubers in sweet potato so so one example in case of animals what plants what we can take is thorns of bougainvillea right so thorns of bougainvillea as well as tendrils of cucumber right so thorns of bougainvillea and tendrils of cucurbita so this is one more example of what we can take with regards to homologous organ so here again thorns and tendrils both have same structure and same origin but their function right so i hope all are familiar with thorns as well as tendrils right so there's they have same structure as well as same origin but their functions are different right thorns in case of bougainvillea as well as tendrils in case of cucurbita right so this is what we have with homologous organs so i hope all are clear with this so definition as well as a few examples so once again what is this homologous organs organs of similar structure right and origin but perform different functions is called as homologous organs so the structure is same origin also is the same but they start performing different functions so those type of organs are referred to as homologous organs right now let us get into some more details about homologous organs right i am raising the examples here right now homologous organs would lead to a type of evolution which is called as divergent evolution right so homologous organs would lead to right homologous organs this is important one what we need to remember homologous organs would lead to something called as divergent evolution right it would lead to divergent evolution now what is this divergent evolution all about so divergent it is nothing but a common english word such as diverge right divergence divergence is nothing but 
from one place organism starts moving to another place right so if 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 there is something moving from one place to the other place we start calling it as divergence so here also this homologous organs would lead to something called as divergent evolution now what is this divergent evolution let me make it very simple there is a group of organisms present here right so this is one particular habitat right so this is one particular habitat where there are organisms like a based organisms are all living right so a a are the certain organisms which are actually living in this particular habitat right now try to understand this due to some reasons right so due to some reasons one of this organism from this habitat moved into another place right so from here say this organism moved into another place right so in this particular habitat now right so this organism a has come to this particular habitat now based on the environmental conditions of this habitat this organism underwent some sort of modifications what we call it as adaptations right so this organism both these organisms are the same all of these organisms are all very much similar but due to some reasons say one of the organism from this habitat migrated to another habitat here now based on the environmental conditions of this particular habitat this organism a underwent some sort of modifications what we call it as adaptations because of that adaptations this organism now led to the formation of another species say a one species so this type of evolution we start calling as divergent evolution right as a whole theory of divergent evolution right let me go through it once again very quickly say there a group of organisms are present in this particular habitat let us name this as habitat number 1 right in this particular habitat habitat 1 due to some reasons due to some reason say this particular organism this particular organism it migrated to habitat number 2 right it migrated to habitat number 2 now based on the environmental conditions present in this particular habitat this organism now underwent some sort of modification right it underwent some sort of modification as a result of which as a result of which it got evolved into a new species which is designated as a one species right now let us take up with the example what we have taken up previously with regards to homologous organ when this a one organism was here the structures of all of these organisms were exactly similar right right now this a organism migrated to habitat 2 and became a one even though it had gone to a one the structure and morphology that is structure as well as the origin of all the organs of this organism is exactly similar to this organism here but based on this habitat based on the environmental conditions of this habitat it had to undergo some sort of adaptation whereby the functions got different so now these two organisms here will have similar structures and similar origin but their functions would be different that is what we are talking about homologous organ so this sort of evolution evolution of new species at one place from the ancestral species at another place is what we call it as divergent evolution right so homologous organs would always lead to this sort of evolution called as the divergent evolution very important one what you need to remember right so homologous organs would always lead to divergent evolution right so what examples can we give here for uh what examples can we give here for this divergent evolution right so what examples can we give for divergent okay examples we'll talk a little later once we go in with one more concept here right we'll talk about little later now if there is one organism moving here we call it as divergent evolution now just let us just imagine that this organism also came out and went into another habitat right say this time this habitat is number 3 so this has come here and this would be habitat number 3 right now again based on this particular conditions here in habitat number 3 this organism also underwent some sort of modifications right 
as a result of which it evolved into species called A2 species. Similarly, let us talk about this organism here. Right? So this organism also migrated from this habitat number one, right? And moved into another habitat here, right? So this would be A, and here this would be habitat number four. Right? So again, due to environmental conditions present in this habitat, this organism also underwent some sort of adaptations as a result of which it evolved into another species, say species A3. Let us talk about one more. This species also, this organism also now come here, migrated to another habitat, right? And based on the conditions present in this habitat, that is habitat number five, habitat number five, Right? So it got evolved into another species that it underwent some sort of adaptations and it got evolved into another species, say A4. This one is would be A4. Right. Now this is one adaptive, sorry, this is one divergent evolution. This is one divergent evolution. This is one divergent evolution. And this is also one divergent evolution. So if there are more than one divergent evolution happening in a particular habitat, such type of concept, we will be referring to it as adaptive radiation. We call it as adaptive radiation. Right, so we would start calling it as adaptive radiation. Another important term, what you need to remember. So what does this adaptive radiation mean? If a group of organisms from one particular habitat they move into different habitats. So based on the conditions of that particular habitat, if they evolve into a new species, such sort of thing, what we call it as adaptive radiation. So from the name itself, we can make out radiation is what? Radiating, right? So from one central point, there is something radiating. So this is the central point. So from this central point, one organism has gone this side, one organism this side, one this side, and one this side. So from the central point, it got radiated, right? So once after radiation, what is happening? Adaptation, right? So based on their different habitats, they are undergoing a process of adaptation. So because of these adaptations, it is now leading to the evolution of new species. Right? So this is what we refer to it as adaptive radiation. Right? So homologous organs would lead to divergent evolution. Right? More than one divergent evolution, if it occurs in a particular population, it would lead to adaptive radiation. Right? So this is what we have with homologous organs, divergent evolution, as well as adaptive radiation. So you need to remember all of these important ones. Homologous organs would contribute or lead to something called as divergent evolution. So if there is more than one divergent evolution, we call it as adaptive radiation. This is what we have. So now let us take up a few examples, a couple of examples with regards to this adaptive radiation. Right? So let us take up a couple of examples with regards to adaptive radiation. So the first example what we'll be talking about here is, right? So the first example what we'll be talking about with regards to adaptive radiation is something called as placental mammals, right? So placental mammals as well as marsupial mammals, right? So placental mammals as well as marsupial mammals. Both of these exhibit adaptive radiation, right? So both of these exhibit adaptive radiation. Now, what is placental mammals? I hope all are familiar with mammals, right? Placental mammals are the mammals which have placenta. Second one is marsupial mammals. Marsupial mammals are nothing but mammals having pouch. We call them as pouched animals, right? Like the kangaroos, all that, right? So marsupial mammals, we usually refer to them as Australian marsupials because they are mostly found in case of Australia, right? So these organisms, right? That is the placental mammals, right? These placental mammals, were actually originated in one particular place. But due to some sort of uh, environmental disturbances, these organisms, they started migrating from one place to different, different places. As a result of which, and they got evolved into different species, right? I think in your books, you have the list of all these organisms. 
placental mammals got evolved into almost seven or eight different species of organisms, leading to a process called as uh, adaptive reuse. Similarly, even marsupial mammals also, which were actually the native of Australia, right? So due to some sort of environmental disturbances, again, they started migrating to different places and based on which place they went or which country or which part of the world they went, they got evolved into almost seven to eight different species. Again, talking about the example called as adaptive radiation, right? So this is the first example what we can give for adaptive radiation. So another example what we can give for adaptive radiation is Darwin's finches. Right, so Darwin's finches. Right, finches are nothing but small birds. Right, so finches are nothing but small birds, seed-eating birds. So, right, so these species of birds which are seed-eating, so we usually refer to them as finches. Why we have tagged it as Darwin's finches is because Darwin, we are all very much familiar with Darwin, one of the most prominent scientists with regards to evolution. So we'll be talking about Darwin's theory also in a few couple of sessions later with regards to what work he had done and what were the principles he gave with regards to evolution. Right. So Darwin worked mostly on these particular birds called finches in an island called as the Galapagos Island. Right. So he worked on an island called as Galapagos Island. So this is the place where he actually worked on. Right, he worked on this Galapagos Island. Right, so Galapagos is nothing but a group of islands, almost 13 to 15 group uh, islands together. We start calling it as Galapagos Island. So he worked in this particular island where he observed these sort of finches. So what he observed was what he observed was these finches which were present. Right, these finches are native of one particular place, but again due to some sort of environmental disturbances each of these finches migrated to each of the Galapagos Island. Right? So what he observed was due to some sort of environmental disturbances, each of the finches, right, each of the finches migrated to each of the Galapagos Island. As a result of which one ancestral finch, right? So one ancestral finch, it gave rise to almost 13 different species of Finches, right? It gave rise to 13 different species of finches. That's what we are talking about adaptive radiation, right? So, one group of animal or one species of organism, right? So, one species of organism giving rise to several other species, giving or leading to the evolution of several other species would be start calling it as adaptive radiation, right? So, these are the two examples what we can give with regards to adaptive radius, right? So quickly let us go through what exactly is this homologous organ. So we have been talking about the first type of organs with regards to uh, the evidences from comparative anatomy, which is called as the homologous organs, right? So talking about homologous organs, right? So what are homologous organs? Organs having similar structure and similar uh, origin but performing different functions, we started calling it as homologous organs, right? So we took up a couple of examples also, one example with regards to plants and one example with regards to animals, right? So this homologous organs would lead to divergent evolution. So what does this divergent evolution means? One group of organisms, right, in a particular habitat, if there are a group of organisms, right? So if one organism migrates to another habitat, and in that particular habitat, due to some sort of environmental conditions, it undergoes some sort of adaptations as a result of which it would lead to the uh, evolution of a new species. So that type of evolution, we start calling it as divergent evolution. Things what you need to remember, homologous organs would always lead to divergent evolution. So in a particular habitat, if there is more than one divergent evolution happening, we start calling that process or mechanism as adaptive radiation. So what does adaptive radiation mean? From one single habitat, if there are organisms radiating to different habitat, right? So one single habitat, so from one single habitat, they are migrating or radiating to different habitat. 
So based on those habitats where they migrate to, based on the environmental conditions at that particular habitat, they undergo some sort of adaptations leading to the formation of a new species. Such type of process is what we call as adaptive radiation. So we have taken up a couple of examples also with regards to adaptive radiation. Number one, placental mammals as well as marsupial mammals, they underwent adaptive radiation. Whereas Darwin finches, they also underwent some sort of adaptive radiation. Right? So all of these animals exhibiting divergent evolution or adaptive radiation, right? So they have organs having similar structure, similar origin, but they start performing different functions. So that is what we have the homologous organ. So by analyzing these homologous organs, we would get some sort of a proof how actually evolution had taken place. Right? So this is what we have with the first type of organ under evidences from comparative biology, which is called as homologous organs. Right? Now let us take up with the second type of organs. Right? Second type of organ, which is called as analogous organs. Right? So let us take up with the second type of organs. And the second type of organs, what we'll be taking up is called the analogous organs. So analogous organs would be quite opposite of the first thing what we saw. That is homologous organs. So B would be analogous organs. Right, so this would be termed as analogous organs. Now what are these analogous organs? As usual, first we'll write down, then we'll get into some sort of examples here. So analogous organs, organs having this similar, this similar structure and origin, but perform same function. But perform same function. They are referred to as analogous organs, right? So organs having dissimilar structure. So what does this mean? Dissimilar structure and origin. Here, the structure and origin are different, but they perform the same function. So if any organ has different structure and different origin, right? So if any organs have different structure as well as different origins, but they start performing the same function, then we start calling them as analogous organs, right? So what are these analogous organs? Organs having dissimilar structure and origin, but performing the same function, we start calling them as analogous organs, right? So once again, what are analogous organs? Organs having dissimilar structure, right? As well as origin, but performing the same function. What did we say with regards to homologous organs? Organs having same structure and origin, but performing different function was homologous organ. Quite opposite to that would be analogous organs. So what is this analogous organ? Organs with dissimilar structure and origin, but performing the same function are called analogous organs. So what examples can we give for this analogous organs? Right? So what examples can we give for the analogous organs. So examples what we can take is wings of, so let's take down the examples here, right? So wings of insects and wings of birds, right? So we can take the example as wings of insects as well as the wings of birds. Right? So if you see the structure and functions, they are different, right? So the structure of wings in case of insects and in case of birds, they are exactly, they are actually different. But even though they have different structure and different origin, they would start performing the same function. And what is that function? The function is nothing but flight, right? So organs having different structure and different origin, but performs the same function is referred to as analogous organs. Right? Now, this analogous organs, right? Analogous organs, would, okay, let us take up one more example here. One more example with regards to uh, plants, right? The other example, what we'll be taking up is with regards to tubers, tubers of sweet potato, 
tubers of sweet potato as well as the tubers of potato right so the tuber of sweet potato is nothing but a root right so this is a root modification right root whereas in case of potato it is actually stem so the structure is different their origin is also different but their function would be the same so what would be the function of these two now it is nothing but storage of food right so organs having different structures and different origins but they start performing the same function we start calling them as analogous organs so some examples here wings of insects as well as wings of bat the next one is tubers of sweet potato as well as the tubers of potato right so this is what we have with analogous organs right now one more important thing what you need to remember here is analogous organs right analogous organs would lead to right analogous organs would lead to something called as convergent evolution it would lead to convergent evolution right so analogous organs would lead to convergent evolution there homologous organs we said homologous organs would lead to divergent evolution so here we are telling that analogous organs would lead to convergent evolution now what is convergent evolution mean what did we say with regards to divergent evolution we said that from a particular place if organism moves to another habitat we call it as divergent evolution opposite of that would be convergent evolution so what does that mean say here there is one habitat and here there is one habitat and here there is one habitat right so here there is organism a living here b living here and c living here so all of these organisms would now migrate to another new habitat that is being present here right so a would migrate here right so b would migrate here and c also would migrate here. so this habitat now will have organism a organism b and organisms right so they are all converging from different places to one particular point right as a result of which all of these structures will start having all of these organisms will start having different structures performing different functions but once they move into <coughs> excuse me <clears throat> once they move into a new habitat right once they move into a new habitat based on the environmental conditions here based on the environmental conditions here they would adapt themselves right they would adapt themselves such that all of these organisms will start performing the same function that is what we are talking about with regards to analogous organ so such type of evolution we start calling it as convergent evolution so in case of divergent evolution what did we say from this habitat all the organisms are moving they are diverging out to other habitats whereas in case of convergent evolution what we are trying to say is from different habitats these organisms they move to one single habitat so such type of evolution we start calling them as convergent evolution right so let us take up a couple of examples again for convergent evolution right so one of the best example what we can study for convergent evolution is right so the body of body of whales and sharks so if you see the body of whales and sharks whales and sharks are two different groups of organisms right so whales and sharks they are actually of two different groups of organisms right so shark is a fish whale is a mammal but both of them live in the same habitat that is water now since they are living in water their body has to be modified in such a way that swimming would be possible in water so they modified their body into streamlined body so that both these organisms even though they are not related to each other they came together to one particular habitat in that particular habitat they underwent some sort of modification so that both these organisms are able to survive in this particular habitat by evolving streamlined bodies right so this is what we call it as convergent evolution one more classic example what we can give for convergent evolution is i'm writing down here right so the body of the body of earthworms right the body of earthworms as well as snakes right so this is one more example what we can give right so the body of earthworms as well as snakes right so if you see earthworms and snakes both of them again completely they belong to two different groups earthworm is an elite snake is nothing but a 
coordinate right or non coordinate and the coordinate right so even though they belong to two different groups of organisms right so what is happening based on the habitat where they are stay where do they stay they usually live in soil burrow right so based on that they modify themselves so that they are able to stay in that particular place such type of evolution we start calling as convergent evolution right so homologous organs would lead to divergent evolution analogous organs would lead to convergent evolution right so this is what we have with the second type of organs what we have with regards to evidences from comparative anatomy right so two different types of organs we have seen so far today right one is called the homologous organs and the other one is called the analogous organs right so we started discussing about evidences for biological evolution right since it is no no individual has identified or observed any change in uh, any change in an organism in favor of evolution because the lifespan of humans is very very short what i said in in the initial part of the class is scientists started collecting evidences from different branches of biology of which we have started off with the first branch of biology which is nothing but evidences from comparative anatomy right so we have been studying about the morphology as well as anatomy of different organs so by uh, studying as well as comparing the morphology as well as anatomy of different organisms right we will get a clear picture of how evolution has taken place so with regards to that with regards to that with regards to evidences from comparative anatomy we started studying different organs of which the first organ what we took or the first type of organs what we took up was the homologous organ so what we saw in homologous organs is organisms uh, or rather organs having same structure and function but sorry same structure and origin but performing different functions are referred to as homologous organ so we took a couple of examples also there and i told you that homologous organs would always lead to divergent evolution a group of organism moving to another place leading to evolution of a new species more than one divergent evolution we called it as adaptive radiation again we took a couple of examples also with that second type of organs what we took up is analogous organs so we said that organs having dissimilar structure as well as origin but they start performing the same function we started calling it as analogous organs right so i told you that analogous organs would always lead to convergent evolution right so organisms from different habitats they migrate to one particular habitat and in that particular habitat based on the environmental conditions of that particular habitat they would undergo some sort of modification so that all of the organisms present in that habitat would perform the same function so with regards to that examples we have taken up two examples one is the body of whales as well as sharks streamlined body another example is body of earthworms as well as snakes so that they will be able to burrow in the soil right so this is what we have with two different types of organs so we have three more organs one is called uh, the next organs what we'll be taking up is called vestigial organs then we have atavistic organs and then we have the connecting links so these three types of organs so we'll start taking up in the next session right so we'll stop here for today fine thank you